church. Now, long before he became a general, Colonel George Gunvalls was a responsible man who headed the completion of the Panama Canal. It's been a while since all this happened. But as you might imagine, along the way he encountered several problems. If you know anything about that area, it can be hit with climate changes on a dime. The geography there is especially challenging. But the hardest thing that he had to deal with wasn't the climate, it wasn't the geography, but had more to do with the growing criticism that he was receiving from back home. How many of you know that the greatest critics in your life are often those that are closest by? Yeah. A lot of them predicted that he'd never finish the pro project altogether. And finally, a colleague asked him, aren't you going to answer your critics? He looked at them and he said, in time. Another one followed right behind him. He said, well, when? When, when is that going to happen? His answer is the answer. He said, when the canal is finished. As many of you know, the Panama Canal was completed in 1914. It was at that point that he answered his critics. Like many others, he could have blamed people around him. You know, this is the common tactic that has been in play since the very beginning of time. Let's blame the people that are around us because it did take him 10 years to complete the project. But he chose to take responsibility for himself. He was the one leading the effort. Like Cain, he could have attempted to shift the blame saying, am I my brother's keeper? By the way, the answer to that question is yes. You are your brother's keeper. There's no doubt about that. But that's not what happened. The colonel who led that engineering feat knew that his duty was to complete the canal and he never tried to palm the responsibility off of anyone else. It was his responsibility. Your responsibility, like my responsibility, is to be a follower of Christ. To do what he has asked us to do. Not what we think we need to do. How many of you know that your emotions will lead you in a direction a lot of times that you don't need to go? I feel like doing this. I don't feel like doing that. Well, sometimes your emotions are in line with the way and the will of God. But a lot of times they're not. And when they're not, we do what God has asked us to do in faith, which, by the way, is detailed in the Word of God. Taking responsibility is the primary message of the text for today. Paul wanted Timothy to know that he was liable for the care of his fellow elders and vice versa. He wanted him to know what must be done for fellow elders, fellow leaders within the church, within that local Ephesian body. This is what has to be done. This is what you're responsible to do. This morning we'll conclude this series, which I started a year ago. That was COVID. I started a year ago by learning how pastors must carefully honor church elders. They have to carefully honor church elders. In this section of the scripture, Paul has basically made two sub-points to what you see up on the screen. The screen. Pastors must carefully honor the church elders. The first sub-point stated that we honor them because they're laborers. They're laborers. What's funny in this text of scripture and with what we've done in the church overall is the fact that you didn't just have one elder being Timothy, but you had several elders within one body. Now this was foreign to us for a long time within the Baptist church because we would say that there's one pastor and there could be multiple people stepping alongside to help them, even though they might have been elders, we didn't recognize them as such. We say, well, that's a Presbyterian thing. We don't do that. Well, folks, that's a scriptural thing. I don't stand up here as the Lone Ranger, and neither should any man do that. If you allow that within the church body, what you're asking for is a dictatorship. 
A lot of churches have gone by and they say, I don't remember that good leader. Man, he'd get up there and preach. He'd, he'd preach a good one. He'd shuck the corn. Usually if they're shucking the corn, they needed somebody standing alongside them because of the attitude of that individual. He loved himself a lot of times more than Jesus. There was a distinction that was given between elders. And there were those who labored in word and doctrine. Okay, they set themselves apart. Now, it's not that the others didn't hear. It's not that the others didn't teach from time to time. But these labored in word and doctrine. If that's the case, Paul said, give them monetary support. And they were supposed to be supported by the church so that they could stay away from the common labors of the day and do other things that would benefit the entire congregation. And second, church leadership was responsible to honor elders because... They're loyal. They're loyal to God. The section that dealt primarily with what we would call a review, extreme care was also encouraged because of the previous credibility of the individual. It's very difficult to be a pastor, and you're going to see some of that brought out in the text this morning. It's very difficult to stand up and proclaim the word of God a lot of times knowing what's at stake. And when you make a mistake that's public, a sin that's public, it has to be dealt with ultimately publicly if the individual does not repent of said sin. And Paul made that point to Timothy because we can't allow it to continue. If it does continue, then you end up in an area that you don't want to be in. And standing on Old Testament practice, Paul instructs the elders in appropriate church discipline for city pastors while respecting their position within that local assembly. <coughs> Excuse me. The third and final sub-point of 1 Timothy 5 is made in 22 through 25 where the liability of church elders is discussed. And there we see that fellow pastors must carefully honor church elders because they're liable. They're liable. Starting in verse 22, it says, Do not lay your hands on anyone hastily, nor share in other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. The verse that I just read is what we call in Bible study a bridge verse. It's a bridge verse. It bridges the cautious rebuke of the loyal elder with the liability or responsibility that they all share together. And pastors play such an important role in kingdom education of the people that they must always be on guard. There's never a point where we get to back down and lay down our guard. They always have to be on guard when it comes to their own personal actions. And that's why Paul started this section by telling Timothy not to lay hands on anyone hastily. Throughout Jesus' ministry, many people wanted to lay hands on him, but he didn't allow it. If you recall, there was a time where he went to his own hometown in Nazareth, and when he got there, he goes into the synagogue and he begins to preach. Now, I want you to picture this, because a lot of times we read Nazareth, we say, oh, I know Jesus is from Nazareth. But what you don't get is, a lot of times these local tribes or relatives live in close proximity, right across the street from one another. Road, whatever it was. But they, they were very close to one another. They were in each other's houses. They were having fellowships with one another. And Jesus was growing up. They'd be able to point to him and say, look, there's old Jesus, Mary and Joseph boy. Look at him out there playing. They knew each other intimately. Spent a lot of time with one another. And Jesus comes back. And one of the first times that he comes back, he goes into the synagogue and he preaches a message from Isaiah 62. You know what he basically tells all of his relatives? You're a bunch of sinners. I don't want you to do this next time you have a family gathering. <laughs> he shows up. He says, you're a bunch of sinners, and you need me to save you. Without me, you won't have salvation. A lot of you believe you're saved, but you're not. You read it. That's what happened. Luke chapter 4. You go back and look at it. This is what's detailed. And then they then chase him out of town, and they try to throw him off the edge of a cliff. Do you think? His own people were mad at him when they tried to lay hands on him. They were. On another occasion, Jesus was 
teaching in the temple, and he was confronted by some Pharisees. In the exchange between the two of them, again, I'm paraphrasing, but Luke chapter 8, or sorry, John chapter 8, you go and read it for yourself. Jesus approaches these guys. He's having this conversation. He's teaching with other people in the peripheral around them. And he says, God is my father. Satan jerks. Now, that one never goes across well. The people don't like to hear it when you tell them that Satan is their father. I know we think that a lot of times about people, don't we? And Jesus called a spade to spade. He said, look, Satan is your father. My father's God, he tells me what's right and righteous to do, and that's what I follow. They then attempted to lay hands on him. They wanted to stone him to death as well, but they couldn't get to him. In John 18, when Jesus did finally allow men to lay their hands on him, they undoubtedly did that with a little bit of reservation. Jesus had spent time with his disciples in the upper room. This was the time where he gave them the last minute instructions. He's talking about what's about to come next. They get part of it, but they don't believe all of it. Anybody else like that? You hear scripture, you understand it, but it doesn't really sink in. That's where the disciples were. And then he then, after singing Psalm 118, they go out. And he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane where they pray. And the disciples keep falling asleep. You remember all that story. Eventually, there's this entourage led by Judas Iscariot. They come into the garden. And when they arrive there, they call out trying to identify him. They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And when they call out to Jesus of Nazareth, he says, I am he. At the moment that he says that, Everybody that was encircling him, according to the Greek, it wasn't them coming in this great crowd, but they had encircled him all the way around, flew backwards. One of the coolest scenes you see, I, I love that one, in John chapter 18. Eventually he allowed it. They came and they did arrest him. But do you think that they were a little bit more cautious when they approached him that time? They did lay hands on Jesus, but it was something that he allowed to take place. Throughout the millennium, many have argued that Paul was suggesting that very practice that I've just been talking about. They stated that he would allow physical confrontation as long as it wasn't done in haste and it was directed toward an elder, toward a person that's like a pastor within the church. He said as long as it was towards them, it was fine. If you recall, Paul had just finished talking about how to approach an elder who had been caught in sin. His reason for that instruction was reconciliation, not retribution. Ultimately, desiring forgiveness for anyone struggling with sin, the Apostle Paul, who wrote the same letter that we're studying today, had this to say in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. He said, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you are a spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burden and so fulfill the law of Christ. Folks, if laying hands on someone equated to a physical altercation, you would have seen a whole lot more of that throughout history. Now, I'm not saying that it didn't happen. One of the stories that we, at least at First Baptist and a lot of Reformed churches will say throughout the years, that we'll talk about the fact that St. Nick, Santa Claus, decked some people. He did. It's a historical fact. He laid hands on some that deserved to have hands laid on them. You know what I'm saying? If you look at the writings of John Chrysostom, however you want to say that, he, he said, by example, that this should be done when men get out of line, when they're sinning, and everyone around them knows it. Instead of insulting an, an individual, laying hands on someone in this context actually means to recognize a man's stability and acceptance into public ministry. 
It's not beating someone up. It expressed solidarity. It expressed union and identification with these other men. The practice had its roots in the Old Testament. If you recall, in the Old Testament, when they went to sacrifice an animal, you would see the priest lay his hand on the animal, on the sacrifice that was about to be given. The same thing was happening and carried on into the New Testament. They would lay hands on this person, identifying them with the sacrifice that they were about to make. Does that make sense? And it's kind of, so, so you have them laying hands. You've seen it done here within the church body where we came together and a uh, deacon was down front and we laid hands on them. That is where that practice originally came from. Over time, it became the common New Testament way of recognizing somebody that was going to be a part of the church body, part of its leadership. Today, we equate the laying on of hands with ordination. When a man is ordained, we honor them both with an office and with extreme authority. In the New Testament, this practice was performed by two distinct groups. Now stay with me on this one. First, we see that the apostles ordained elders in various churches. After Paul and Barnabas had prepared some of their disciples to face the coming tribulation, in Acts 14.23, it tells us this. They appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. The apostles, who were directly taught by Jesus himself from the time of his baptism through his resurrection. These are the apostles. That's how it's defined in Acts chapter 1. You do not have an apostle otherwise. You have lowercase apostles who were sent out to do duties, but these guys were stepping <laughs> up to the plate and they said, we are direct ministers of Christ. He's taught us and told us what to say. They went out and they ordained people that were to be in the church. That was their responsibility. The second group that ordained elders were associates of the apostles, namely Titus and Timothy. In Titus 1.5, Paul instructs the young pastor, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So Paul left Titus to go and instruct and to ordain men to be in the ministry in those places. Not only were Timothy and Titus associates of the apostles, but they were residing elders in their local churches. Being such, they, along with other existing ordained elders, to be additional men that helped within the church body. We know that because the apostle Paul said that in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, he says, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with, look at this, with the laying on of hands of the who church? Of the who? Of the ownership. That's the pattern that has to be followed. We have done something drastically different. I'm going to say within the evangelical church. It is not okay, and the place that we've arrived at with critical theory that's happening across the Southern Baptist Convention and in other denominations that have readily accepted came out of roots which we started practicing long ago. You say, well, what exactly are you talking about? We go to call a pastor, and we look around the church, and we say, okay, now who do we need to get involved to do this? I'm not necessarily saying, so don't leave me on this. I'm not necessarily saying that this was the practice of First Baptist, but in churches where I grew up, that were, it was commonplace in the churches that were all around me, they looked and they said, well, you know, this is a good, outstanding youth, so we've represented that group. You know what? This lady here, man, she is mature in the Lord, and we need to bring her in. We need to bring her in. She needs to sit down, and she needs to help us find our next pastor. And then they look, and they say, all right, is there a man that is worthy of the position? And they say, oh, well, we'll bring in Brother Tom, and he'll sit down with us, and this is going to be our search committee as we go out and look for the next pastor. Folks, when you look at a cross-section of the church, you might have some of the most qualified biblical people that you could ever imagine. 
I agree. No doubt. But that practice of bringing in a pastor and bringing in a cross-section of the church to have those people say, this is the man for the job, is not a biblical practice. The scripture right here alone tells us that that's the case. If you want to bring in or ordain anyone into the ministry, that is to be done by elders within the church. Amen? Amen. I'll preach that long enough. Somebody will come alongside me. Many churches have gotten off track with this practice. However, biblical instruction could not be clear on the matter. Ordaining anyone, whether they're stepping into the office of a deacon or possibly an elder must never be done in haste. And Paul instructs Timothy not to share in other people's sins. I don't know how much clearer he can make that. <clears throat> Many years ago, I was asked to take part of an ordination council for a young man that was mentally off. He was slow. He and his family hopped from church to church. And the reason that they were going from church to church is they wanted to find that one pastor that would acquiesce and take the young man under their wing and train him up so that he could step into the ministry and be a pastor. Well, along the way, pulpits were offered. What do I mean? He had the opportunity to preach. But he'd step up and he'd preach. And most of the church, when everything was said and done, would walk away and they were more confused than when they came in. And they said, well, maybe this isn't the exact area that he needs to be in, so they invite him to children and youth events. He'd come in and he'd be with the children and he'd be with the youth. You know what the reaction was of most parents? The parents said, there's something not quite right here. There's something off about this individual. He eventually was brought up on charges for groping children and youth. They then came to me and asked me if I would ordain him. You can imagine where that one went. I did not give in. I actually refused, and the family was pretty upset with me during that time. Eventually, he did find someone that was as inept as he was, and the deed was done. They ordained him, and I'll say this, church, they ordained him even though God clearly did not. I walk into this position first and foremost, as Pastor Aaron did, and there's several other elders here within First Baptist. We come into this position because God ordained it to be so. And we followed in what he asked us to do. Folks, recommending someone for a job that's incompetent is one thing, but endorsing someone who's not called to ministry is absolutely disastrous. In doing that, you share. These are Paul's words. He says, you share, or you hold in common their sins. You say, well, I've been a part of an ordination council, and we brought in someone. Listen, you're responsible for the one that you bring in. How many of you have been in charge, and you've hired someone that did not need to be in a position, and then you have to step back and say, well, that was me. The church didn't get a pass on that one. We're all responsible when it comes on that as well. If a person misses the mark, if they don't fit the bill, they should not be hired into the position of pastor. As a matter of fact, if you're on the committee that hires that person, then you're an accomplice to their crimes. That's precisely why Paul follows up that warning by instructing Timothy and all elders to keep themselves pure. To try to remain as holy as possible. He literally wanted them to guard themselves from personal loss or, energy, uh, or injury by refusing those who are unfit for the ministry. Church laying hands on anyone, male or female, which it shouldn't happen for the female because we understand what 1 Timothy 2, 
1 Corinthians 14 say about the ministry, but laying hands on anyone that's disqualified is tantamount to putting a pedophile as a teacher in an elementary school. And if you knew someone was a pedophile, would you hire them and put them into an elementary school? No. You know what the only difference is? The pastor that's unqualified will cause more damage than the pedophile will in the elementary school. You say, well, those are strong words, Pastor. They are, but you've got to understand that we're teaching people the Word of God, and I don't just affect one person. I affect everybody in the congregation, and I'm held to a higher standard, not just by you, but by God himself. And let me tell you something. When it comes to you or God, I'm going to go with him. Amen. This is a very difficult thing for Paul to instruct Timothy on. As you can imagine, knowing his protege personally and realizing the pressure he was placing on him, Paul continued in verse 23 saying this, and here's that verse. No longer, only drink water. This is a command, by the way. No longer, only drink water. But use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Folks, we don't know exactly why Timothy's stomach bothered him? And why he frequently got sick? We don't have anything documented that tells us exactly why that was happening. What we do know are the circumstances that he found himself in. We know that some of the common religious practices that were taking place in that area were greatly affecting him. And being in Ephesus really any of the pagan cities of that day, drunkenness and ritual prostitution were quite common. They were always trying to pull them in, and one wasn't done without the other. So drunkenness, prostitution happening at the same time. He is a minister of the gospel in a very dark place, in a very dark time, and he did not want to be associated with one of those cults. Now, how many of you in here would commend Timothy for that? You look at him and say, I can understand why he wouldn't want to drink any wine because he didn't want to be associated with the cults in the area. I think most of us could kind of understand that. That's one possibility. It's also possible that Timothy fell in with the ascetics of his day. The people that were ascetics, they would practice severe forms of self-discipline. This is why if you go back one chapter to 1 Timothy chapter 4, he said, some of y'all are abstaining from food and marriage because you think this is going to take you to some kind of higher spiritual level. That they would just deprive themselves of the very thing. And he follows up that passage saying, these things that God has given you are good. They're going to be enjoyed by all men. But yet, you're abstaining from them. So there, there's a possibility that Timothy got in with the ascetics of his day. And he said, you know what, I'm just not going to drink any wine. It's not a good thing. Either of those circumstances could have led to Timothy's feebleness, to the physical condition that he was in, but the context paints a more plausible picture. And I don't know if you've heard this before, but I'm going to lay out to you the reason that I believe Timothy needed the wine. The pressure of ministry is real, folks. Do you understand that? Make me want to take a drink. We know for a fact that Timothy had to call out errant elders. That is not in question. He had to do it. So he walked up to men. He walked up to men that were false teachers or they had just gotten out of line with scripture. And he said, hey, you can't be doing that. So Paul tells Timothy, you've got to go and set them straight. That's one thing that was definitely happening in 1 Timothy. He was responsible for delivering the letter to the people of the church as a whole. Now, how many of you know that when you receive bad news from somebody, you immediately point at the messenger and go, oh, why are you giving me this? You know, it's been said for a long time, don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the mailman. He was the mailman, but everybody was still pointing at him. And there is at least a sense of culpability where he was 
in their teaching, and he was saying, I'm going to live in this way, and I expect you to do the same thing. The scripture also tells us that he was likely a little bit younger. Younger was relative. I mean, he could have been in his upper 30s. It is never comfortable for anyone to have to walk up to someone who's older than you and rebuke them for sin. How many of you have been in that position where you saw something going on, a practice that wasn't right, and you had to go and set someone right? Was that fun? No. I think what makes most sense, even when you read 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy as well, what makes most sense as a young pastor in a community where paganism was everywhere, it was just a dark day, I think he worried himself sick. I think if you want to put something, I think he worried himself sick. This is Roy, this is not church history. I'm just telling you, reading this letter, studying it, getting into the heart of what was happening here, I believe he was thinking about the activities and the lives of the people that were within his church, and he just, it just overwhelmed him. I want to ask you a question here for a moment. I want you to think about your own life. How many of you in your own job got to the point where you worried yourself so much that your stomach hurt? There's people looking at each other in here right now. I think he worried himself so much that he had an ulcer. A complete yes. I'm admitting that up front. And then Paul comes alongside of him and he says, look, you're going to need to, to drink some wine to mitigate what's going on with your health right now. It's clear that Timothy desired to be a model of spiritual virtue and he never wanted to do anything that would cause anyone to stumble. However, Paul instructed him that he needed to be committed to his health as well. Now, I, I know what some people are thinking. Well, if he was just drinking the water, then there was any number of disease that could set in. There was dysentery during that time. Many of the ancient leaders of that world, like Plutarch, Hippocrates, all these guys would say, you need to mix wine and water if you're going to drink water. Paul didn't say that actually in his letter. What he said is you need to go ahead and you need to drink a little bit of wine. Now I've been told in the past that I needed to do that very same thing. I don't like it. I don't like drinking things that are sour. It's not something that I want. It's not something that I desire. But they said this would be good for your health. Now as a pastor within First Baptist Church, According to the instruction that's given here, what should I do, church? I should be drinking wine, according to the instruction in Scripture. I know that this argument can go back and forth with a lot of people, and there are some strong opinions when it comes to alcohol. But what you see in Scripture when it comes to drinking, it says, do not get Even Jesus partook of the Seder. We had four cups of what? Grape juice, right? During communion. It was wine. He was even blamed as being a wine bibber at one point, where they said, This guy's drunk. Now, how can you blame somebody for being a wine bibber if they weren't drinking it? It's irrational that we even have to go down this road to explain this. There should not be extremes in your life where sin is caused. Amen? Amen? God gave us all things to enjoy, but not to abuse. And if that's the case, then you take this, and he was using it in a medicinal way. You use it in such a way so that your health is what it needs to be. And with that said, I believe that pastors are responsible for their health. Elders are responsible for their health. And sometimes if you need to take medication... Take your medication. This is what needs to happen. If you need to get your fat back in, I'm trying to 
filter here, up and walk, and take a walk. If you need to watch what you're eating, then watch what you're eating. I, I don't know what it is, but the pastor's health is important. And that's what Paul was saying to Timothy. Hey, buddy, you can't continue the way that you are. You're sick. You can't minister. How many of you have been around a pastor and they could not keep their health together? Look, I like to go in for big surgeries, get it done, <laughs> and keep moving. But we have to watch out for our health. And that was the only point that Paul was trying to make to Timothy. The last two verses written in chapter 5, last two verses, help Timothy to understand and subsequently his elders why caution and ordination was so paramount, why it was so important. In verse 25, the apostle went on to say, Some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men will follow later. Church, are some sins easier to spot than others? What do you think? Yeah, some sins are obviously easier to spot than others. Wouldn't it have been helpful if the Lord would have provided us with a list? I mean, just... Just lay it out for us. If you tell us that we see these, then, then we can know for ourselves. Well, he did. Thank you for that segue. Because Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, plainly says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. They are evident, which are adultery, fornication. You didn't understand, understand the difference between adultery is having an intimate relationship outside of the marriage bed. Fornication is having an intimate relationship when you're not legally married. Amen? Y'all understand what I'm saying? So you get that. So these things are pointed out right here in front of us. We don't have any guesswork. And God said that these are sins. He put it through the pen of Paul. He said, this is what you need to know. Well, there they are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery. How many of you are putting on a pointy hat and casting spells on people? That's not what this is talking about. It's talking about pharmaceutical drugs. And there are a lot of people today that are abusing prescription drugs. Amen? I love saying it wholesale within the congregation because I can get away with that without getting the reprisal on the other end. Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries. Do you see drunkenness? He said drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not, I, I'm, I'm not even going to say it, will not what? Yeah. Yeah. Pastor, I screwed up one time, and I did one of those things. Are you telling me I won't inherit the kingdom of God? No, I'm not. But if you make a common practice to do the things that are listed on this screen, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's not because you're simply practicing it. It's because you're advocating and saying God's a liar. That's why. You're saying that doesn't count. I can do this, but that doesn't count. I'm not accountable. Right? Right? Things that that don't apply to me. That's for everybody else. Right? You use that argument when you get in front of God and see what he says. There are some sins that are just hard to hide. And we all know that. Therefore, if a man seeks approval from the presbytery, from the group of elders within the church, blatant sins cannot precede him. Why in the world would we elect a man to one of the highest offices in the land who exhibits outbursts of wrath just all the time. That's the common practice of their life. We know that scripture says that they're supposed to be gentle and involuntile. In, close enough. Involatile. You get it right? We can't invite somebody to be a part of First Baptist Church Hydesville that endorses heresies. I've seen some men that were correct on a lot of doctrine. And it might come that their Christology or their pneumatology, studying the Holy Spirit, 
and they were just wildly off. And somebody says, well, you know what? We can bring them in because if we bring them in, it'll be fine because they're good in all these other... No. There's some places we can't give them. There's salvation by Jesus Christ alone and faith alone. And if you don't believe that, you don't deserve to be a pastor. Warnock is not a pastor. Can I say that from the pulpit? Yeah. Yeah. He's not. Yeah. Yeah. He never has been. He is an evil, evil man. And I will back that up. I'm sure I'll pay for these later. I'm just having a fun Sunday. <laughs> <clears throat> the sins of a man being considered for the station of pastor are evident to everybody that's around them. He should be shut down immediately. Why? Because his sins. These are Paul's words. What he said in our passage study. Paul said that he should be shut down because his sins preceded him into judgment. In other words, it was just evident to everybody around them. They knew. But a lot of times we want to pat somebody on the back and say, well, you know what, we like you. Come on in. I'm not like that. See, I still keep doing. All right. Even though many sins are obvious, Paul said that some weren't. Some are discovered after a man has been ordained. He says they follow them later. It is impossible outside of the direct revelation of God to know whether a man is suited for the position. You cannot absolutely know that. So there's a balance here. He said, don't bring somebody in that's obviously sinning. And if somebody seems to be good on the surface and you bring them in, maybe you didn't catch it at first, but that's okay. Because you can't catch everything. You're not God. You can't see into the hearts of men. No one truly knows the hearts of the people around them. As I was writing this, I could not help but think about one of the greatest <clears throat> apologists our nation has ever seen, who fell, Dr. Robbie Zacharias. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is to tell you a couple things. Folks, we look at him, and there was a lot of truth that he told. There really was. But he had things going on in his life that he never should have been a part of. He got involved with women when he shouldn't have. I'll tell you, there are a couple of things that really stick out. Number one, he wasn't a pastor. So we're not going to hold him to that standard. Number two, he was never involved in a church. His ministry took precedent over that. I can tell you this right now. We've had a struggle with people coming back into the church since COVID started. Some of it was legitimate. I mean, like, people couldn't come in because they have pre-existing conditions. If you heard me say that, say amen. amen. You can come back in. You had to be saved. Now there are shots out there, but the percentage of death related to COVID, we don't even need to get into. It's low. <laughs> Folks, this man was not gathering with the church body. Now, if he wasn't gathering with the church body, he wasn't receiving instruction from the Word of God like he needed to hear it. And if he wasn't receiving that instruction, maybe he thought he could do some of the things that he thought he could do, although we know his very conscience would have told him what he was doing was wrong. <clears throat> Paul said, some sin will follow you later. And they followed him. I believe Jesus said the same thing in Mark 4.22. He once declared, for there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed. Nor has anything been kept secret but that it should come to light. The Old Testament says, surely your sins find you out. Finally, seeking to balance his caution with encouragement, Paul went on to say in verse 25, likewise the good works of some are clearly evident and those that are otherwise cannot be hidden. If you studied this verse out of context, hang with me for this last piece. It is extremely confusing. 
If you try to study a couple of these verses, the one I just read, out of context, you're not going to get. It will leave you in bewilderment. But you've got to take things in context always to really understand what's going on. Attempting to parallel his last statement, Paul makes two positive comments to juxtapose the previous two. Let me show you. Look down with me. In verse 25, he said, likewise, the good works of some are clearly evident. So he said in verse 24, some sins are clearly evident. Then in verse 25, he said, likewise, some good works are clearly evident. So some sins are very apparent, just like some good works are very apparent. That makes sense, right? It, you see some sins out in front of you, they're big as day. You see some good works, and they're as clear as could absolutely be. Look at the second part. In the second part of verse 24, he stated that some sins would go unnoticed and follow men later. He then makes the same kind of statement when referring to good works. There he was talking about good works done in the background or behind closed doors. Those are the good works that are done in an otherwise manner. So why did Paul tack those verses on at the end? What was the purpose? He wanted Timothy to know that he could only do so much. Remember, he's already been dealing with a guy who's sick. You can only do so much. There was going to be an elder council that would gather, and they would pick someone to come in and help lead the church, and they would watch them for a little while. Here's the big point. You've got a list that's given for qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3. If somebody doesn't meet those qualifications, we should take them and discuss possibly, immediately. That's it. You don't qualify, you're gone. But if somebody is qualified, we also need to wait for a little while and not judge them immediately. Not immediately say, this person would be perfect for this position because it could be absolutely disastrous. How many of you have been involved with the church where a pastor just went off the rails? I've seen them get to the point where they claim to be atheists. You talk about 180. Going the absolute opposite direction. Folks, there are clearly some things that need to be done. One way or another, Paul is encouraging the elders to be patient in their selection process. <clears throat> the, church, the church as a whole desperately needs qualified men to serve as pastors or elders. Their lives must meet the standards of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 through 7. So he tells us these are the qualifications. And their ministries, those of 1 Timothy 4, 6 through 16, which was in the previous chapter. The church's responsibility to them is to honor and protect, protect them, rebuke those who sin, and above all, be very cautious when it comes to the selection process. If those four principles are implemented within the church that I just gave, then I believe we will be biblically grounded churches headed in the direction that God wants us to go. The pastors must carefully honor church elders because they're laborers, they're loyal, and they're liable. That's what he gives us in this passage. Sometimes we need to speak of the gifting. When you came to salvation, how many of you know that the Holy Spirit moved in and he gave you a gift that you didn't have prior to that time? And for some, it will be administrative gifts. For some, it will be helps. It will be evident. For some, you have just a spirit of gentleness and you can work with people as never before. Some of you are pastors and some of you are teachers. I don't know what you've been gifted with, but I can tell you this. If you serve the Lord and try to do what you can, then he'll make that evident. For those of you that are here today and you say, I really just don't fit in any of those categories. I haven't seen any gifting. Then this is an opportunity to question whether or not you have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has never changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he said, anyone who comes to him and believes on his name will be saved. Amen? Amen. That is the truth of Scripture. And today, if you're in this congregation and you say, 
I have never believed on the name of Jesus. I've never believed in the qualifications of who Jesus is as God. Today is that day. If the Holy Spirit is working on you in such a way, we need to talk about what it means to be a faithful follower of Christ. I'm going to give you one more scripture and I'll leave you alone and we'll move on because I've been preaching for a while. <clears throat> Luke 9, 23. He said, this is Jesus. He said, if any man desires to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me daily. That is not an invitation. That's an identification. The people who do that are following Christ. So if you say that is the desire of my heart, then we need to talk about that, especially if you've never been in a saving relationship. You need to be discipled, which happens within the preaching and the teaching. We have another session tonight here at First Baptist Church and one on Wednesday. You need to be a part of it as much as you can so that you can grow in the Lord. And if you know Christ and you follow him, Jesus commanded that you follow in baptism, which then is a testament to who he is. Everybody sitting in here, it's not for the church, it's for the lost. But we always have lost, we always have tares mixed in with the wheat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for being so gracious to us. Father, I thank you for electing elders to the position that you have. I thank you for the boundaries that have been set around each one. I can't make the scriptures stick in the hearts of people, but I know that you can. And Father, whatever was of you, I pray that it would stay. Whatever wasn't, I pray that it be thrown out. I pray that all of it would be used for your glory in one way or another. And as we go through this time of song, that we would contemplate the things that we're talking about today. Father, I do pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that you draw someone in here to salvation that doesn't know you. Father, make their voice heard. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name.